Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to our webinar on the implications of new research findings in the management of endometrial cancer. Of course, we're talking about the two big trials just presented at the Society of Gynecologic Oncology in the ESMO meeting. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Brad Monk uh, from the University of Arizona College of Medicine and the Creighton University School of Medicine in Phoenix, and Dr. Matthew Powell from the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. We also recruited some additional investigators to complete a survey that we're going to show you uh, later on in the program, and we really appreciate their input as well. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room, and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We put together a one-minute pre- and post-survey uh, for you to take. Uh, we really would appreciate if you could do that. We'll learn a little bit about you, and you'll get a lot more out of this meeting. We do webinars all the time. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time uh, talking about new developments in uh, bladder cancer, urethelial bladder cancer, specifically metastatic disease, where there's so many options now. It really is a fascinating, exciting area. We'll be back with a program for uh, oncology nurses on July the 6th, uh, focused on uh, CLL. Uh, then we'll be doing our uh, continuing our Inside the Issues series, uh, talking about the management of high-risk uh, MDS on July the 11th. We've got a great program on uh, skin cancers, melanoma, non-melanoma uh, cancers that we're going to be doing on July 13th, and then a program on bispecific antibodies and the use of uh, myeloma on the 18th as well. And then a big topic at the last ASCO meeting, of course, ER-positive metastatic breast cancer, um, particularly the issue of patients who progress on CDK inhibitors. Uh, that'll be on July the 20th. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars. If you're into uh, audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a program uh, we did with Dr. Mirza on endometrial cancer. But today we're here to talk about uh, really what happened at SGO, pretty uh, monumental, something we've been waiting for. Uh, we asked uh, both of the faculty to put together presentations summarizing the key data sets that we're talking about today. So we're going to start out talking about first-line therapy. Of course, that's what we're focused on with the Ruby and NRG trial with uh, Dr. Powell. And then Dr. Monk will review the many promising investigational options of being looked at. Here are some of the papers uh, that we'll be referring to in these uh, presentations as we go through it today. We're going to just start out with a little bit of an intro, and then we'll get into the two presentations, and then we'll try to go through as much of the survey of the investigators, but we invite you to check it out afterwards if we don't get through everything. We asked a whole bunch of questions. Uh, so I want to just start out, and Matt, uh, this is uh, the beginning of your talk, but I just wanted to chat a little bit about it. So I'm going to ask you uh, just a comment on sort of a little bit of an overview of endometrial cancer before we dive into the data. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Neil. And I'm uh, really excited to talk about frontline therapy. And this first little bit is focusing on where we are, what we've been doing. And and uh, really, in the, in the past uh, several decades, we've seen this dramatic rise in the cases of endometrial cancer and uh, really becoming a, a cancer that most people didn't hear much about to something where we're seeing a lot of deaths and actually uh, likely to surpass the death rate of ovarian cancer here in the next few years. Uh, and really, this is driven by an, an aging population, driven by uh, the obesity epidemic. And, and uh, unfortunately, with endometrial cancer has one of the largest disparities in outcome among our among our non-Hispanic Black women, and really that mortality rate is just st uh, staggering. Uh, and especially as we adjust for hysterectomy, uh, we see this problem, and we don't have a good answer. Uh, we're studying this intensely and trying to figure out, you know, what care factors are there, uh, what else is driving this uh, disparity, including uh, uh, molecular biologic issues. Um, and uh, I'm going to probably get to the next slide, then we'll kind of talk about these as, as three and really looking over the last century where we are. And uh, when we gave this talk 20 years ago, we would probably say, well, the only thing that we know that works in endometrial cancer is doing a hysterectomy. We've learned a lot. Um, and we, we've learned a lot more about not just prognosis, but also uh, predictive biomarkers is really where we are 
recently, predicting therapeutic interventions that make a difference. You know, lymph nodes for a long time we thought were, were therapeutic. In reality, they're not. They they may uh, help the guide therapy, but they weren't therapeutic in and of itself. So we spent about 20 years talking about lymph nodes. And now we're here finally with some therapeutic options that are different. And I'll probably have Dr. Monk talk a little bit about some of the things he sees in this diagram that really strike him as exciting. Yeah, that's really what I wanted to chat about before we get started, because uh, you've both been so deeply involved in clinical research uh, in this area. I was curious about your thoughts. Uh, Brad, any thoughts about uh, you know this incredible story, and particularly the issue of how the biomarker story has evolved over the years? Yeah, good seeing everybody. Thanks, Neil. Hi, Matt. Good seeing you, my friend. I'm going to focus all the way on the right of this slide, on the pole uh, epsilon uh, de-escalation. Uh, uh, we don't generally test routinely for poly because it's next-gen sequencing. We'll do ER, we'll do P53, we'll do mismatch repair, and even HER2, all IHC. But I, I think that that's what I'm most excited about. I'm most excited about curing patients even when I don't have to treat them. And that's what the de-escalation is. These are a hypermutated uh, phenotype where because the neoantigen load is so high, the body's immune system automatically cures cancers that would otherwise not be cured. So that's what I'm most excited about. Matt, any uh, thoughts about uh, where, you know, how this diagram is going to look in a couple of years? Well, I, I, you know, we'll be talking a lot tonight about defective mismatch repair, proficient mismatch repair. You know, there's many different terms for that, MSI high, MSI low, MSI stable. Um, but I, I want to say that uh, where we're heading is really understanding the subgroup of the tumor, the molecular characteristics of the tumor, and getting to the right therapy to the pa right patient at the right time. So uh, before Matt goes through the data, quick uh, question from the chat room. Brad, this is from Dr. Kumar, who's a Florida cancer specialist, medical oncologist. He says, uh, I have a patient with endocervical adenocarcinoma. Do these data apply that we're about to talk about? They do not. But the other data that was presented at ASCO, uh, which was a pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy with or without bevacizumab, I had the opportunity to present that, uh, uh, which shows a 12-month improvement in overall survival is relevant. Yeah, that really is an incredible uh, study. All right, let's uh, continue with uh, uh, your talk. Uh, Matt, if you could go through sort of where we've been, but in particular, of course, the two big trials, uh, the RUBY study and the NRG study. Right. And I, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. And many of you know GOG-122 was one of the, one of the uh, GYN studies that was highly featured at ASCO back in 2005 or 2006. I can't remember what year that was. But it was radiation versus chemotherapy. And really, chemotherapy came out ahead. And then we, we spent several years refining the chemotherapy from uh, single agent to double agent to the triple therapy of TAP. And then finally, the large study, uh, over 1,300 patients looking at GOG-209 of carboplatin paclitaxel versus the TAP regimen and really showing the easier regimen of carboplatin paclitaxel being appropriate and kind of our cytotoxic backbone that we've used for everything since that time and even before. And this is not only an endometrial cancer, but also our carcinosarcomas. Um, so we were able to study a lot of these uh, uh, diseases uh, together. You know, when I and both Brad and I mentioned, we're learning a lot about the molecular characteristics. And a lot of this comes from the TCGA. Um, again, almost a decade ago, we learned about Pol E or polymerase epsilon being very mutated, the MSI or hypermutated group. Um, and then the copy number high group, which is really kind of our P53 altered copy number high uh, population. And then there's the rest of it. And that's the copy number low group or what's called the not otherwise specified or MSMP group. These have very different outcomes and respond differently to the immune system. And we'll talk about how that looks. And we're really learning that these are different cancers and have different therapeutic uh, uh, options for them and different outcomes. And you see that P53 group really doing the worst and that'll come back as we, we talk about this. So where are we with the systemic therapy? And as mentioned, you know, carboplatin paclitaxel um, is our preferred regimen. These are the older NCCN guidelines, um, but this also for our HER2 positive patients, we have an option for the addition of trastuzumab. 
and then also with the carcinosarcoma patients. When we look at second-line therapy, uh, Dr. Monk's going to be talking about this further, but really levatinib pembrolizumab is something we're very excited about. And then for a defective mismatch repair or TMB high population, single-agent pembrolizumab or distarlamab or one of the other uh, checkpoint inhibitors can be utilized. Um, we can't forget that we also have an estrogen positive population and hormone therapy has been shown here uh, to be active uh, as a target and uh, uh, you know much work is still in this area. When to, when to treat on the hormone path, uh, when to treat with the addition of letrozole and everolimus uh, is up for debate still and how to put this in your armamentarium is uh, tricky. I think a lot of people say if you're not in an organ crisis and you have some small volume disease and it's ER positive, low grade, probably a good patient for hormonal uh, strategy. But really what we're talking about um, I'm gonna, uh, is really based on uh, where we are in a biomarker negative population. And these are recurrent studies that Dr. Monk's going to go into further. I wanted to put these in here because it looks like our PD-1 inhibitors maybe are a little more active than our PDL one inhibitors. When you look across uh, uh, this population in a biomarker negative or PMMR population, and similarly, maybe a little more activity with the uh, PDL1s in the DMMR population. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we see this higher rate of response with the PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors rather than PDL1. And we carry this forward when we think about these first-line trials I'm going to be discussing. GYO18 and Ruby are the ones that were presented in, in the New England Journal and at uh, SGO this year in March. Uh, I had the uh, luxury of being the senior author on both papers. Actually, on 018 was the co-senior author with Dr. Agajanian, but really led uh, uh, the Ruby trial here in the United States. Uh, we have DOE that is uh, recruit all its patients. There's a news release that this is a positive study. That's adding in a laparib. Um, there's a Ruby part two that's added in uh, niraparib that's uh, completed accrual as well. And then we have um, LEPO-01, which is a trial we're really excited about, which is lamvatinib pembrolizumab up front versus carboplatin paclitaxel. Um, again, you might say, well, that's antiquated now because we have carboplatin paclitaxel IO, um, but nonetheless, I think that's going to challenge, and when we see these data, challenge what we're doing. ATTEND is a, another trial looking at tazolizumab in a similar manner. Uh, that study should be reporting the next year. And then Keynote uh, C93 is looking at maybe just using checkpoint alone for the DMMR population. Again, this trial is actively recruiting and we should have results soon. But let's really just cut to what we're most excited about and that's uh, chemotherapy plus IO. And this actually came out shortly before, this was in February, we saw this randomized phase two study of Avalumab, which again is a PDL one inhibitor. Um, and if you look at the, the population here, the, the standard versus the experimental group, uh, there was a slight benefit of the addition of checkpoint here. But actually, all that benefit was in the DMMR population, as shown on the right. And actually, it looks like you did worse if you got the PDL1 inhibitor in the PMMR population. So the trend was actually worse receiving checkpoint in the PMMR population. So this really had us nervous about what are we going to see in the Ruby trial and in GYO18. And uh, we'll spend most of our time talking about these two studies. This is uh, Ruby, which again, I was the US lead on. Uh, it's a phase three randomized trial of chemotherapy, plus minus distarlamab with distarlamab maintenance. This maintenance went on for up to three years and that was a Q6 week strategy uh, during the maintenance phase. This study also had unique in that it had carcinosarcoma, about 10% of the patients were carcinosarcoma, and some non-measurable high-risk patients uh, that weren't included in 018. Um, when we, and most of you have probably seen these data, but the uh, uh, objectives looked at the PFS in the DMMR population, you'd see that was wildly positive. Their hazard ratio of 0.28, um, really no doubt, and, and really flattening of the curve here where we're perhaps uh, seeing these long-term benefits with people not progressing many years out. In the overall population, which again, both the deficient and proficient population, we have a hazard ratio of 0.64. Um, this trial is a little more mature than 018 and with a little longer follow-up. Um, it also had an, uh, an evaluation of overall survival. You see this hazard ratio of 0.64 
uh, showing it uh, in the overall population, and 0.3 uh, hazard ratio in the overall uh, survival of the DMMR population. So really exciting. This wasn't statistically significant yet because of a small amount of alpha, alpha attributed to this, but this will be further evaluated once fully mature, but it's certainly looking quite positive with a p-value of 0.0021. Looking at the subgroups, uh, a lot's been made of some of these subgroups. A lot of questions have been made, I would say. But you see most things favor uh, the uh, experimental arm with the addition of Zestarlamab. People have asked me what happened to Europeans. I think this is just they had a bigger hit with COVID. It wasn't open. I don't think Europeans are responding differently here. That's just less mature data. Um, when we look at the side effect profile, again, about 10% more side effects when we think about the addition of IO therapy, but really no new safety signals. Um, and then just shown in tabular form, I really think, you know, meaning, clinically meaningful PFS benefits and OS trend that looks going to be, looks to be maintaining significance and a, a acceptable safety profile. Um, and we'll probably touch back on this during our discussion, but 018 is a similar trial, but the statistical design is different. It's carboplatin, paclitaxel, plus minus pembrolizumab. And then we did uh, uh, two years maintenance of the uh, pembrolizumab because we moved that to Q6 weeks uh, shortly after the development of the trial, especially when we hit COVID. We, over, we moved this to a Q6 week maintenance strategy. So two years of maintenance of pembrolizumab. But otherwise, fairly similar, a little uh, different entry criteria, no carcinosarcomas in this study, and a few of the less aggressive non-measurables weren't allowed either. Um, the uh, study did uh, have a good uh, um, um, uh, racial uh, admix of, of uh, non-Hispanic black patients. I think it was 14%, so good representation for a U.S. study. Um, the progression-free survival here, uh, is shown on the left in the DMMR population, which again was independently powered, hazard ratio 0.3. And then in the DMMR or the proficient population, that hazard ratio 0.57 with a median uh, uh, there of 11.7 versus 8.7 months. Um, so we're quite excited with these two separate cohorts. OS is not uh, mature yet, but really no real outlier groups here. Uh, when you look in the DMMR population shown on the left or the PMMR population shown on the right, um, the uh, patients with prior radiotherapy may be uh, benefiting slightly less, but there's really no groups um, uh, that we would say otherwise. A lot of people ask me, well, what about those serous cancers? And they clearly fall on the left side of the line here. So their heads ratio looks to be consistent with the overall population. Um, when we look at adverse events, again, a slight you know, increase that's expected uh, among both populations, um, and really leading us to where we are today. Very exciting time with an endometrial cancer, really unprecedented. You know, I've been doing endometrial cancer research for over 20 years, and to have randomized trials, not just one, but two, but five in our space is just so exciting. And I think we'll really be challenging all of us to understand our biomarkers, understand what the right population is, and really how do we apply these new trials to our practice. So thank you so much. So thanks a lot. That was really a, a great uh, summary of, uh, of these data. Uh, we could spend a long time talking about what it means, uh, uh, but let's just sort of cut to the chase or some of the key questions that I'm hearing people ask. I'll start with you, Brad. So let's start out with the MSI high uh, patient. First of all, in general, when you look at these data, Brad, any way to sort of separate out the two IOs, uh, Dostarlamab? You know, we asked this in the, uh, it's sort of putting aside whether or not you can get it, actually access it. But, you know, sort of from a theoretical point of view, you see any difference in how these two IOs are behaving in these two trials, Brad? I, I don't. Um, they're both anti-PD-1, uh, although their schedules are a little different. They're not in the maintenance phase. There is, as you know, a head-to-head -head comparison, though, in lung cancer called the PERLA trial, which did not meet its statistical significance for overall response rate. But the PFS difference, again, not the endpoint of the tr trial in this phase, to favor dostarlamab. And I get it, it's lung cancer. But there is an example of a head-to-head -head trial, but in endometrial, the results look very similar. Really interesting. And again, sticking with uh, MSI high, Matt, I guess one of the questions, particularly medical oncologists are asking, because of course they have a long history treating MSI high or pretty long history uh, with uh, single agent IO. 
and we look here in endometrial cancer, we don't see an arm like that in these two trials. Uh, so what are your thoughts about that? It looks like the response rates to single agent IO, I'm not sure why there wasn't a trial looking at this, but they look pretty substantial. Uh, what are your thoughts about what chemo is adding here, uh, Matt? You know, in lung cancer, uh, particularly in the PD-1 high patients, we think about adding chemo to IO and people who are sicker, who need a response quickly. Um, how are you right now thinking about MSI high? You know, sort of putting aside, again, access. Uh, clinically, how do you think about treating first-line therapy of incurable metastatic disease? Yeah, that's a great question. And we do have the C93 trial that's trying to evaluate. Again, that's going to just be single-agent IO versus carboplatin taxol, uh, which isn't going to answer that question you just asked. Does triplet therapy matter? And, uh, you know, we, we have some theoretic reasons to think triplet therapy is important. You're creating neoantigens as you kill the cancer, allowing the immune system more opportunities. Um, we're, we're looking at powering studies to, to answer whether we should be giving single agent IO. There are large studies. It's going to take a while. Um, I, I do think in the right patient population that either is resistant to chemotherapy or intolerant to chemotherapy, single age, agent IO therapy for our, for our uh, naive population or first-line therapy patient, uh, IO therapy is getting widespread use. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, with good activity. Now, there's some caveats there. You know, the reason for their mismatch repair deficiency may matter. If they have a somatic or germline mutation, they seem to do markedly better. You know, most of the patients with rectal cancer that responded in the rectal cancer trial, those were almost all somatic germline patients. Those patients that have uh, methylation that's driving their mismatch repair, so promoter methylation of MLH1, probably don't do as well. So there, that population is what we see about 80, 70 to 80% of the time in endometrial cancer is a methylation-driven difference rather than in rectal cancer. Uh, that study is mostly somatic and, and germline. It's really amazing how much time I spend talking to investigators, how often I hear stuff I've never heard before. What you just said, it was like amazing. I've never heard that somatic, the rectal, really cool. Anyhow, getting back to the clinical, Brad, how are you thinking about, again, MSI high patients? If you have an older patient with a lot of comorbidities, do you think about single agent IO? I do. But, but let's, let's be clear. In the DMMR MSI high patient, adding immune therapy is a no-brainer and mandatory. The controversy, and you focus on controversies very nicely, and that's why I enjoy listening to you. Do you need the chemotherapy? Probably not, but in a well patient, I'm going to add it. And um, But it's it's a no-brainer. As you know, dostarlamab has been filed to the FDA and has a PDUFA date, an action date in September. Um, and I would ask Matt, so these trials are very different. One was funded by the government, Pembrolizumab, NCI. One was funded by Pharma, the NCI trial was an interim result with only 8 to 12 months of follow-up. The pharma trial had twice as long of follow-up, more than two years. The pharma trial, Dostarlamab, will have overall survival because it's an international trial, and they were monitored different. Neil, you asked us about the differences in the agents. I get that. But tell us about the differences in the trials. Definitely, you know, everything you said is exactly true. That You know, the degree of monitoring is different for an uh, NRG study than it is when you have an in-house monitor double checking everything. Um, the maturity of the studies are definitely different. So, I, I, you know, time's going to tell. I mean, PFS and OS, um, yes, there's uh, resist um, being asked of the NRG study as well. Um, that's already been reported and, and we reported that at ASCO for the Ruby trial. Um, you know, the the confidence and, you know, what's going to happen to these hazard ratios over time, mm -hmm. it may all end up looking pretty darn similar, I think, as yeah. Brad's getting to. And when you look at side effects, when you have, uh, I think we've all run uh, NCI trials versus uh, pharma trials, the scrutiny is, is somewhat different. So you may see a little more reporting of side effects uh, on one versus the other. And in Europe, where so, Ruby and Dostarlamab might have an overall, sorry, Neil, might have an overall survival advantage, that will be the preferred reimbursed agent in Europe based on the OS difference. Because as you know, in, in GY018, there's crossover. And although survival is looked at as not analytic, because in the US, as I'm going to talk about, 
you can get second line Pembro either alone or with lenvatinib. And so that's why overall survival is not uh, analytic in GY018. Yeah, that hazard rate uh, with the dose Darlamab of 0.3 for survival. I don't think I've ever seen that in a trial almost. It's amazing, unbelievable. Bracket and Anyhow, part. let's we'll get, get I knew we could part. spend like two hours just talking about this, but let's just try to capsulize it. Let's come back to the MMR patient. Uh, we're, a lot of controversy there, Matt. Um, you know, I don't know if we're going to get to to the survey, but one of the things I we ask people is, what do you think the survival would be if you had a trial that compared first-line carbotaxel followed by lenvatinib Pembro versus first-line carbotaxel IO? Uh, whether or not in the long run it would make a difference. Clinically, maybe you want to get the IO in earlier. Uh, Matt, I'm kind of curious, are you flipping over completely to uh, chemo IO and MS stable patients or thinking in, thinking about the possibility of not using a first-line and coming in with lenvatinib Pembro second line? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. And, you know, when we look at this much more modest hazard ratio in the proficient MMR, MS stable population, it really challenges should we be using upfront IO or should we save it to where that lenvatinib Pembro lenzumab combination, as we know, is so active in the second line? And, you know, if I had to guess, the additional the addition of the TKI, that VEGF signal, probably being most important, is what's driving the benefit. And and you don't have that if you're just giving carbotaxel IO alone. So I think IO, um, uh, perhaps with the VEGF inhibitor or the multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor is important. And let me just make that real simple. For PMMR, the strategy of carbotaxel followed by lymphatic pembrolizumab, it probably would win versus a three-drug regimen of carbotaxel IO alone uh, from, from trying to put the data together, cross-trial comparison, all the things we're not supposed to do, I would I would bet on uh, carbotaxel followed by lumbatinib parambolizumab right now. I would agree with that too. So uh, what for practical purposes, though, what are you actually doing, Brad, with these patients? Are you giving them IO first line or waiting and giving it with lumbatinib pembro? Yes. Because <laughs> I, I don't know the right <laughs> answer. So it, it, it depends yeah. on the risk. It, it, yeah. In a patient that's uh, basically going to recur and die for sure, I'm probably going to give her the best chance now with a triplet regimen. Um, but in the lower risk patient, I'm going to do really what is sequence, give them carboplatin, paclitaxel, if they're PMMR, and then when they recur, but that's rare because we cure a lot of patients with oligometastatic disease then I can give them pem pembro lenvatinib then. You know, one of the most common reactions we get to our work is people like it when you when you all don't know the answer because they don't feel <laughs> alone. They're out there thinking, <laughs> That's right. I don't know what to do. They know what to do. But when you go, you don't know what to do, they find it reassuring. So yeah. just one more uh, thing, and uh, we'll get into your talk, uh, Brad. But first, quick question from the chat room, Shabhana, uh, Matt, so uh, has a patient with metastatic MSI high disease who has gotten six months of chemo. It seems like doing well. Would you add in an IO at this point, even though the patient is not progressing? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I think you're uh, with such an active regimen. I don't know that it matters to get, you know, to add it adjuvantly or add it when there's not progressing disease. I think, she probably has maxed out her chemotherapy. Following that patient carefully and adding in IO if you see progression would probably be my strategy. So you really know that you need it. Um, you know, those are uh, always tricky things to, to, to when you have a new therapy, when do you add that in? You know, I certainly still think about that for patients with the PARP inhibitors. When do I add this in if they haven't had it before? But, uh, you know, we're, we're, um, it's nice to have new tools. But this patient, I'd probably wait until the patient clearly progressed. So uh, we'll see if we have time at the end to come back to this. Again, we could talk about this for hours. Just want to show you the press release uh, Matt referred to about the Duo E study that's going to be, uh, I believe, presented at ESMO. And it's being reported there are three arms here, uh, but uh, they're reporting both arms positive, although I don't, I don't know if there's a comparison between uh, so adding Derva uh, the, uh, to uh, chemo seems to benefit, uh, uh, and then Derva maintenance. 
But then there's another arm where they get Derva with chemo. And then in addition to Derva maintenance, they get Olaparib maintenance. The press release says both arms are positive. We'll see whether we can even compare them or not. So again, so many things we could talk about, but let's just try to at least get out on the table where we might be heading. Before you start your talk, though, one final one thing I was going to ask you before about Matt's point about MS stable, Brad, is the issue of maybe new trials that'll somehow bring in an anti-angiogenic. You were chatting before we began here about your interest in a trial looking at uh, anti-angiogenic in the maintenance setting. What's your vision for that kind of strategy, Brad? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, Matt and I have now before energy, um, a bevacizumab anti-angiogenic. So you could theoretically take what, what Matt, what you nicely did with chemotherapy Pembro and then add bevacizumab to it. Remember, bevacizumab is approved in cervix and ovary. We never really got to it in endometrial. But given the ability of anti-VEGF therapy in many tumor types to overcome checkpoint resistance, and be, given the tolerability of bevacizumab compared to oral TKIs, uh, Matt, keep pushing that for me, my brother. I like that. You know I like that. Definitely. So it's... We're getting so many great questions in the chat room. It's killing me not to ask all of them, but I'm going to just do one more and then we'll go to Brad's talk. So uh, Matt Rosano wants to know, we have this in our survey, but you know, maybe we can just bring it up right now. If you give chemo IO first line, what's second line? MSI high and MSI stable, Matt. Well, I'm hoping Dr. Monk's going to enlighten us during his talk, <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, I think we do have a, a study looking at Ipinevo for that population that has received it and didn't progress on it. But uh, so Ipinevo is GYO25 uh, versus single agent checkpoint. And, you know, for the mismatch repair deficient population, that study's open. For the proficient population, you know, I'm probably going to be trying levatinib pembrolizumab given it's our most active second line agent uh, regimen because um, our other options are not great. Our other options are reap treatment with carboplatin paclitaxel. Carboplatin paclitaxel maybe with Bev, maybe our most active, but again, if they've depending on when they failed uh, their chemotherapy. And then single agent uh, adriamycin or doxorubicin or um, uh, taxane, again, just aren't very appealing. It's just, you know, 10%, 10 to 15% response rates in the second and third line strategy. Um, we need We need better things. And I think that's what Dr. Monk's just about to tell us. Absolutely. And when I saw that question in the chat room, I just thought trial, trial, trial. Same. I mean, there isn't, <laughs> right. is not a good, there is not a good non-trial option. But yep. as Brad's about to say, there are a lot of great trial options. So Brad, could you please review that? Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I like to talk about three things. Integration into frontline. Matt, you stole the thunder. It was amazing. Uh, second combinations. I'm going to talk about it in novel combinations. But the answer to that question, second line today is a clinical trial, and you have my commitment as co-director of the GOG by the end of the year to have a randomized phase three trial in all comer population of a novel agent in the second line. So I work work on it almost every day. Uh, we've gone to the FDA and we're almost ready to roll on that. I can't tell you what it is yet because it's not listed on clinicaltrials.gov, but I'll uh, you know that's what we're gonna we're gonna do. Matt, I can't I can't believe. That, 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 that the incidence and prevalence of endometrial cancer is out of control. You, you said it, um, and, and it, it, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. But fortunately, we were here. This whole exciting journey started in 2017 with the biomarker agnostic approval of pembrolizumab and MSI high subgroup. Of those 149 patients, there were only 14 that were endometrial. We still got the approval. And then we got accelerated approval again in 2019. I'm going to talk about it, Pembrol and Vatnib, now in the non-MSI high or the PMMR subgroup. And then we got another Dostarlamab approved. The Dostarlamab Garnet trial was interesting because it gained European approval based on a single arm, generally not achievable. Uh, Simiplumab and squamous cell skin cancer is another example. And then ultimately got the full approval. I'll touch on that, that phase three trial. It has an ASI named 309. It's a Merck named 775. I'll call it 775. And now in 2022, pembrolizumab has regular approval. So you can't come in with another checkpoint inhibitor in the second line because now there's regular approval for pembrolizumab. You'd have to beat 
pembrolizumab. If you're one of the, I think there's nine checkpoint inhibitors, you'd have to beat pembrolizumab in a head-to-head comparison. But these second line, MSI high, single arm trials, both which led to FDA approval are transformational. And, 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 and really uh, amazing with the response rate right at about equal to chemotherapy, which is about 50%. And not only are there responses, but they're durable uh, and they're complete at least with a 10 to 15%. So this is nothing new and, it, and it's been there since 2017. Um, but the, 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 the two-year DOR is 71% here on this slide for Keynote 158. And so we, when you said it, Matt, we might even be curing some patients again in the DMMR second line and for sure in the DMMR first line. So the unmet need in the second line is those that are not MSI high. And we talked about the ability of an anti-VEGF molecule to overcome that. And that's present in many, many tumors, hepatocellular, renal. And this is the combination that adds a anti-VEGF to pembrolizumab in the second line. Uh, and it's only in the PMMR subset, because if you're MSI high or DMMR, you should get single agent pembrolizumab or dostarlamab. And this was just published earlier this month. So in the PMMR subset, what do you get in the second line versus physician's choice chemotherapy, which is single agent uh, doxorubicin or weekly paclitaxel? So you get 5.8 months improvement in overall survival. So if you use, let's say, dostarlamab or pembrolizumab, in the front line, PMMR, you get a couple of months PFS. But here, if you use it in the second line with lenvatinib, you get 5.8 months of OS. So again, you have other options, and that begs the question why it's an uncertain opportunity in the front line until there is a survival advantage. But that's why dostarlamab has only been filed in the front line in the DMMR subset, because the front line PMMR is marginal and in the second line there's an opportunity in the PMMR subset. Now it's all about the adverse reactions. The adverse reactions to Dostar to pembrolizumab and lenvatinib are predictable um, and you can see when they occur and, 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 and these slides are available to you. I want to point out though that the dose interruptions in lenvatinib are two-thirds, 66 percent. I don't have a pointer. And the discontinuation rate is half of that a third. So people say, oh, I don't like that pembrolizumab lenvatinib combination because two thirds of the patients need to dose reduce and a third of the patients can't tolerate it. And so there is some dosing flexibility. We start, and again, lenvatinib is at different doses based on the different indications because the dose was optimized before we did these trials. We start at 20 uh, and then can go to 14, 10, and eight. Some people start at a lower dose. If the patient was eligible though for the study, Keynote 775, I start at 20. Uh, and I have a very aggressive uh, uh, strategy to help those patients. So, but what's the future? And that's really what we're looking towards. Matt, you already presented Ruby, nicely done. GY0 and 8, nicely done. You showed the press release of DOE. Now DOE doesn't compare the arms between themselves and doesn't separate the DMMR and the PMMR subsets, which you have to do. So that's going to be complicated. And attend uh, uh, will be tezolizumab. And as you know, DOE, Dervalumab is PDL one like a tezolizumab. But it's a, I want to now focus my last few words on uh, antibody drug conjugates. We, we live in an uh, individualized world and, and BRCA, as you know, and, and HRD and MSI. An antibody drug conjugates is nothing new with a, a target, a, a, a linker, and, and a payload. Uh, and, and these are very exciting and, and, and really extensive in GYN. We have two uh, approved now, uh, one in cervical cancer, tezotimab vedotin against tissue factor, and mervituximab serovantancin against folate receptor alpha in ovarian. Uh, and, and we're really hammering this hard, uh, but all of the phase threes are in um, cervix and, endome and, and endometrial, excuse me, cervix and ovary. So we're hammering it hard in the non-endometrial cancer. So that's my commitment to you is to bring you phase three endometrial cancer ADC trials. And sort of the two most exciting targets are HER2 and TROPE. And everybody on this uh, educational program understands and knows and probably even utilizes trastuzumab deruxtecan. Trastuzumab deruxtecan is a wonderful agent 
Uh, it was studied in a, a Destiny Pan tumor study uh, that was presented at ASCO. So the question is, does trastuzumab deruxacan work in HER2 one plus or greater non-breast cancers? And the answer is yes. And, and I, I point out that this is the gastric guideline. Uh, the gastric guideline, as you know, looks at HER2 uh, um, basolateral rather than uh, membranous. Probably doesn't matter. Uh, in CRC, they've shown it doesn't really matter, and we don't, we don't really know. But I want to show you the endometrial because a 57.5% response rate, okay, uh, with some complete responders, 17.5%, with a, a, a median duration of response that was not met as transformational. And on this is also cervix and ovary, which is not what we're talking about here. But we're going to do an ADC trial, at least I hope we are, with a, a, a HER2-directed antibody drug conjugate. It's all up to the sponsor, but there are many sponsors that are interested in that. The expression matters. Uh, again, these were one, two, three plus. Uh, if you look at the two plus or greater, it was 47.1%, greater than three plus 84.6%. So this medication is there. Again, it's gastric, it's gastric scoring. I point out to you that the Japanese did a very nice study uh, in the same sort of situation, one plus or more, in carcinosarcoma published in the JCO. Carcinosarcoma is a very high HER2 expression. And you can see here, again, north of 50%. So don't forget about carcinosarcomas, uh, and they are indeed endometrial carcinomas. They're not sarcomas to speak of, and Matt has been a world leader in, in teaching us that. So what about TROPE? There were two TROPE studies published. One was an investigator-initiated trial by uh, Alexandra Santin from Yale and a sponsor uh, a trial by Gilead. This one looked at overexpressing trope 2 patients with a 50% or greater. Uh, and you guys know uh, sacituzumab very well uh, uh, with a metabolite of aronatecan uh, as a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. Uh, and so the, the interesting thing, trope is expressed in 96% or so of endometrioid tumors and about two-thirds of serous. So in addition to HER2, now we have trope. Okay, and this is a small investigator initiated trial, uh, 21 patients, about a third of them responded. So I think there's a signal here with an antitrope ADC. And again, there, are, just like there are numerous HER2 opportunities, there are numerous uh, trope opportunities. Uh, I just put in another opportunity. This is another HER2. The data doesn't matter, but you'll hear about this duality. And I could have pinned in other trope two, but the concept is there that we have anti-HER2 and anti-trope ADCs in the second line, and we already have a POC, a proof of concept. So we're gonna continue to do earlier. We're gonna, t uh, lines of therapy, we're gonna continue to look at combinations, but we're gonna look at new agents based on biomarkers. And I'm not sure if we need trope two as a biomarker, you guys don't use it in breast. We'll have to sort that out, uh, but for today, Second line treatment in the IO naive patient, which is most, is dostarlamab or Pembro if they're MSI high. And if they're not, then it's Pembro linbatinib. No brainer. What you said, Matt, oh, if she's had Pembro before, I'm going to add the linbatinib to it. I thought that was in, intriguing since we have no data on that. Um, but uh, I don't know how you'd ever get it paid for because that is an exclusionary. Um, but um, uh, uh, we appreciate everyone's help, and it's good seeing you today, Neil. Thank you. So, yeah, that was an uh, interesting thought about Lenvina Pembro also, I noticed. I was, I was thinking the other thing you hear people talk about is Ipinevo in that situation, but again, I don't know whether we have any data on that. So let's just take a quick look at the survey and kind of compare notes and when we ask other investigators. As you were going through the TDXD thing, I was just saying, looks to me like you need to get a HER2 ASAP as soon as you have metastatic disease. That's right. That's right. So, and, and we here, need to get a, uh, when a we protocol, ask, yeah, and an FDA approval, but you're right, for now even, yes. And, uh, you know, our way of doing consensus conferences or guidelines is we ask people what they do in different situations. If everybody does the same thing, we call it a consensus. So I'd say there's a consensus that people with metastatic endometrial cancer need a biomarker workup. Uh, investigators generally are using NGS and certainly IHC as an option. 
and her too, I think after what we just heard, I think is even more important. Let's just compare notes a little bit in terms of some of the things we've been talking about. So we asked uh, people at Bursabell, first line therapy, MSI high. And in general, it looks like the uh, extended faculty is up for uh, the chemo IO approach, except Dr. Penson, who's sticking with the colorectal approach of single uh, agent IO. Um, and then the question that we were just talking about before, uh, second line, well, we were talking about after uh, carbapaclitaxel IO. This is what people are doing second line right now that uh, Brad uh, just uh, commented on. Uh, this is a question, and when we were at ASCO, we did, I think, uh, 10 programs, uh, uh, Matt, and every one of them, the issue of chemo uh, shortage came up. And I, I'm curious, I know it's variable across the country, but certain, there was a big article in the New York Times, I think it was yesterday or the day before about this. Uh, certainly there are a lot of places with shortage of carbo and some even cis. Any thoughts of what are you thinking about? Do you have a, an issue with access to a carbo, Matt? Yeah, we're getting down to our last two weeks uh, estimated supply. Um, but, you know, there may be some that comes in and there's some, you know, we're predicting at a large medical center is always tricky. But, you know, we do have now uh, developed uh, plans for the use of oxaloplatin, as you see across here. But, you know, I think uh, other people may think, shoot, I'm going to move right to lumbatinib pembrolizumab. But what a lot of the colleagues are suggesting here, very reasonable to think about. Or going with a non-platinum compound of doxorubis and paclitaxel, which we have reasonable data for that Dr. Slomovitz suggests. So uh, we also asked about uh, first-line therapy, MS-stable disease. Brad made a very good point here saying uh, it depends on the stage. So certainly people, we're not talking about people with a ligometastatic disease where you're going to go for cure, although I am curious whether you would use sort of pseudo-adjuvant systemic therapy after that. Uh, but it looks like in general, uh, with you know, I guess Dr. Liu's holding on a little bit, uh, uh, but most people are thinking about uh, trying either one of the IOs uh, plus uh, chemotherapy. Uh, Matt, we kind of already uh, talked a little bit about this uh, before uh, in terms of that. Uh, what about this issue that Brad brought up about uh, people with oligometastatic disease where it's removed or uh, radiated? Uh, do you ever use sort of, quote, pseudo-adjuvant therapy, Matt, you know, afterwards? They're NED, but... A high risk for recurrence? Yeah, I think, you know, again, the patients that were included in GY018 and in Ruby were big volume patients for the most part. They're they're not the patients that had one or two lymph nodes. And, and I think that's the tricky part when you start thinking about who to apply this to. It was pretty strict criteria. There were high risk patients that were involved in 018 in Ruby. Um, and then when it gets lower risk, what am I going to do? Um, and as Brad said, is it better just to wait for lumbatinib pembrolizumab in this population? Uh, it's a tricky decision. We're having a lot of discussion. Um, I think, you know, as we mentioned, their P53 mutated population seems to benefit from anti-VEGF signal. Um, you know, should pembrolizumab be in the mix? And that's one of our proposals here is carboplatin paclitaxel pembrolizumab uh, plus minus bevacizumab for this population with the proficient MMR and, you know, a four drug therapy, much like we have in cervical cancer now, um, which, you know, our most active four drug reg regimen in cervical cancer may be the right thing in endometrial cancer. Uh, Brad, any uh, comments and also uh, maybe relate your experience in terms of lower risk metastatic disease, you know, oligometastatic disease, what are the sites that you see? How do, what kind of local therapies do you use? How do you think through those cases, Brad? Yeah, let, let me answer that, and then I want to make have two other points. So these patients that have positive lymph nodes, uh, and the, the volume of cancer in the lymph node matters. So even it's not just the number of nodes, it's the volume. But those patients can sometimes be cured with a hysterectomy and six doses of carboplatin and paclitaxel 70 to 80% of the time. So to, and it, so if they're PMMR to add an immune therapy to that when the cure rate is two thirds or greater doesn't seem to make much sense. I want to make two other points though. That population though, the adjuvant population has been studied in a trial called B21, which has more than a thousand patients and it's done. And that study sh should report in the short term, it will have almost a thousand PMMR adjuvant patients this very setting. 
And, and it'll have to be clinically significant, I get it, but we're relatively excited about that. Tepembro is only for a year because it's adjuvant rather than two years where it was in, in the, the previous studies. And then the third point, we, this P53, Matt, I liked what you said, that in the P53 mutated, there is an opportunity for checkpoint, but these P53 wild type PMMR patients are unique and we have a number of studies for them in the front line, in the adjuvant setting, not in the adjuvant, but in the maintenance setting. So let's say you have a patient that's PMMR that gets carboplatin paclitaxel as a PR or CR. That patient can enroll on a clinical randomized phase three trial with oral cell and XOR, which is a, a XPO inhibitor, the, the nuclear transport mechanism of P53 out of the, the nucleus. That study has been studied in an all-comer population. It showed a fantastic result in this P53 wild type subset. That study is called Export EC and is open around the world. And there's another study with uh, uh, another molecule, an MDM2 uh, inhibitor uh, funded by Cartos. So, yeah, cell and extra is such an interesting drug, also a challenging drug uh, to use so uh, clinically in terms of uh, tolerability uh, issues uh, as well. Um, so another thing we asked about, and we talked about this before, whether or not any preference between the IOs, most people say no. A couple people say Pembro, maybe my guess is more related to practical issues of access, being used to it, et cetera. I think most people would agree. Uh, the data certainly doesn't look very different. But this is a really interesting question. Actually, this kind of reminds me what happened with Neraprib and Olaprib in uh and ovary, the issue of duration of treatment, Matt. Uh, any comments? It looks like people are thinking about using two years in spite of the fact that it was three years with the Ruby study. And of course, I guess you're speculating about what you're going to do two years from now. Who knows what's going to be going on two years from now? But in general, how are you thinking about uh, duration of treatment, Matt? Yeah, you know, it's uh, we deal with this a lot now. We have a lot of these patients that are getting to their two-year mark on uh, patients that weren't on study, especially the lumbatinib pembrolizumab that had some endpoints to it. Patients aren't wanting to come off. They're feeling well, doing fine. And and, and uh, I'll be really curious for those that are saying two years here, what happens when their patients actually get to two years and the patient says, boy, I'm scared to come off here. So, um, you know, the, the two versus three when we designed the trials was somewhat arbitrary. We didn't know the answer. I, I think two years is probably adequate for patients that don't have any further evidence of disease and maybe have had a one year in a complete response, something like that. I, 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 we just don't know. I mean, uh, how long this therapy needs to be. Certainly financial toxicity is a big part of our decision making here. Fortunately, we hear stories like that all the time in colorectal cancer. You know, tons of people who are doing uh, really well. Uh, and actually, this issue of uh, what to do with, you know, when you stop or do you stop I.O., Brad, brings up another topic that I ask every peop every time we do a solid tumor program. And usually it's in the chat room as well. And I see a couple of people asking about circulating tumor DNA, uh, tumor-informed, uh, for example, assays like Signaterra, Brad, which are regularly being used now in colon cancer. Do you see a future of that in endometrial or in gynecologic cancers in general? Yes. Um, let me answer the two versus three. So GSK does their studies for three years, and you mentioned niraparib. The initial right, label right. was three years of niraparib, and then it was removed because there were not very many patients more than two. And Matt, what you said, it's two-year treatment and a discussion, really. Uh, we need to do better and follow our medical uh, oncology uh, colleagues and do more circulating DNA in all our cancers. Uh, we need to look for reversion mutations in the BRCA gene. We need to look for uh, MRD, uh, minimal residual disease. Uh, you know, in ovary, we have C125. We don't really have that in endometrial cancer. We've got to do better. We just got to do better. You're right. Matt, any thoughts about uh, is this actually being looked at uh, in endometrial, in gynecologic cancer circulating DNA, Matt? And any thoughts yes. about where yeah, it you know, might be useful? We were talking about yeah, a little so metastatic disease, for example. To me, that would be a great example. Yeah, plus our high intermediate risk early stage population. So those that, you know, you know had negative nodes, we took the uterus out, 
where we have some ongoing studies looking at that. It's a multi-institutional study that's uh, industry sponsored. And then there's some ongoing studies uh, as part of four projects at Memorial Sloan Kettering and Andy Anderson. So um, there's the, the data, you know, for bigger volume disease. Yes, circulating tumor DNA seems to predict that. But for these very early, you know, we're not sure yet. It is not quite as robust as we'd like um, based on the preliminary data, but uh, more, more to come. So stay tuned. So uh, as we always do, and when we talk about endometrial cancer, we ask people about how they're using Linvatinib Pembro. Everybody does use it second line as been going on the last few years. But of course, a lot of controversy about how to use it. Uh, Brad commented a little bit about dosing. It looks like the two of you approach dosing uh, differently. Uh, actually, it looks like Dr. O'Malley used to say 18 milligrams. Now he's saying 20, but... Uh, uh, and also, Brad re- referred to kind of this, how he's built out the, the office structure to really support these patients intensively in the first couple of weeks. So, Matt, what are your thoughts about why do you, do you start out with 14? And what do you do in the first few weeks, not just you, but your team to follow these patients, yeah. Matt? And I, I think what Brad says is you, you build out a team, you have them, you know, daily blood pressure monitoring. You, if they're borderline, they're starting on an antihypertensive even before you start the lymvatinib. You have a strategy for them to call, and the call parameters are built into your your regimen. And I start at 14. They may only stay on 14 for five, you know, three to five days even, and try to escalate them up to 18. I actually write them a script for 18, so I have a dosing flexibility, but start them on 14 if they're reasonably healthy, and they may be starting on 10 if I'm having trouble getting their blood pressure under control already. I mean, if they're, if they're already hypertensive and need more strategy, they, they may start at 10. I, you know, the purist is Dr. Monk, start at 20 and, you know, scare patients, you know, no, I'm kidding. But, We're uh, only scaring you, Matt. <laughs> We're not scaring anybody. <laughs> Keep going. So uh, I guess, you know, the other issue, uh, Brad, is I'm curious, you know, uh, how you approach patients who have diarrhea on Lenvatna Pembro. Uh, you know, I always hear about cases where they held the lymphadenib, the diarrhea goes away. Just the other day, for the first time, I actually heard a case of IO-induced uh, colitis. So obviously, you have two potential agents. Uh, how do you decide uh, how to manage diarrhea with these patients, Brad? Yeah, it's a good question. So the way I look at this combination, so when you give an oral agent, you have GI toxicities and fatigue. That's what you want to talk about. You, they're anti-VEGF, you have hypertension. You said that, Matt. And then because it's IO, you have an immune-related adverse event. And there's some overlap because you can get diarrhea from both. And so you have to make the diagnosis. The good news is is that lenvatinib can be discontinued and the diarrhea should get better. If it's severe diarrhea, grade three, I'm going to send her to the ER and do a CAT scan. In in the olden days, we sort of had a hard time figuring out what's immune-related colitis. But the CAT scan findings are almost pathognomonic because they show bowel wall thickening and that sort of thing. If you go to the ER and the patient has a normal CAT scan, she does not have serious colitis. So that's the question to me when, when I hear about this. Does the patient stop the lenvatinib because it's not that bad? Or it could be immune-related colitis, and, if, and so she needs to go to the ER and get a CAT scan. Wow, that another thing I know, did not know and have not heard was the thing about the scan. So cool. I love it. Okay, yeah. a little controversy to end here. So uh, we said, uh, what about a patient with two positive nodes, adjuvant therapy? And then on the right, you see, well, suppose you could do whatever you want. And you can see Dr. Powell is ready to try adjuvant uh, IO in a patient like this. And, you know, we were talking about these trials you were mentioning, looking at that, of course, Lung cancer, you have not only adjuvant IO approved, but neoadjuvant IO. They're fighting about which one it should be. Matt, what are your thoughts about this scenario? Well, again, you know, I, I think not all proficient mismatch repair patients are treated, you know, are the, are the same. I think, you know, you have your NSMP group, which is your ER positive group, P53 wild type group. And then you have the, the worst group, which is our P53 mutated group. And as I showed the serous population, definitely seems to have some benefit of IO therapy uh, in line with the general population. So that's why I said if it, regulatory wasn't a problem, you know, these patients don't do as well as Brad said, when, you know, when you, when you look at all the all comers with two positive nodes, if you have a P53 mutated tumor, 
you know, ideally I'd like to give you a four drug regimen is uh, uh, with carboplatin, paclitaxel, pembrolizumab and, and a check and a VEGF inhibitor. But uh, that study is hopefully going to be done soon to prove that. Um, but, you know, we can't, uh, especially for our, our black patients, they tend to have these PMMR patient, uh, PMMR type tumors. They do very poorly. And I think getting the right drugs to these patients is important. So a final comment uh, from Brad. Here's the same question, two positive, no MSI high. Again, you see a lot of people, except you, Brad, uh, saying they would try an IO. Of course, it's being looked at in clinical trial. In colon, you know, they, they want to see the adjuvant trials with IO and MSI high because, quote, they're not as chemosensitive. You know, maybe it's not the same. Uh, Brad, any thoughts again about the patient with positive nodes? I think the indication obviously is is greater here in the in the MSI high subs. It's a shared decision making, and so I think that that's that's sort of a cop out. But I I think my level of recommendation in the DMMR MSI high would be a little stronger. So good having you, me today. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. No, it was great. And you know, shared decision making what is what it's all about. I mean, when it's they don't, when the about. people in the community don't know what to do, if you guys don't <laughs> know what to do, at least let the patient know. Let them know what's going on and, yeah. and participate if they Thanks. want. So uh, uh, I've really been looking forward. Ever since I saw that data, I was just dying to be able to do something like this. And this has really been great. I think this is just the beginning. We're going to be talking about this topic and these two trials for a long time. Uh, but Brad and Matt, thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience and wisdoms with us tonight. Audience, thank you for attending. It's going to get even crazier tomorrow night when we talk about metastatic. Only like five different options available in metastatic bladder cancer. We'll try to sort that out tomorrow night. Be safe, stay well, and have a great evening. Thanks a lot, Brad. Thanks, thanks, thanks Matt. Thanks so much, Neil.